All right, peeps. Welcome to another eBay unboxing. I'm selecting my cutting apparatuses. All right, let's get this box open. I'm not sure what it is. It'll probably be on the thumbnail. And let's go. We'll do this in fast motion. All right, so what we got here is something that was um, cheap enough. It was like 20 bucks. It was $19 or something like that. So I was like, I had it in my watch list for like days. And then I was like, nobody saw it. Usually these sell instantaneously, especially at that price range. And I was like, you know what? I might as well. All right. So what we have here is a very, very old crucifix. And usually these ones that are made with ebony. A lot of them were made during World War II, but you could tell that this one is really old. Now I'm going to clean it up. But this was um, what's known as um, like a nun's or a priest's crucifix or something that would have hung from their belt or hung from their neck, like a pectoral. But this one is a little too long, so it may have been a coffin. Yes, it may have been a coffin crucifix. I hope not, because I just don't even want to think about that. But okay, so let's look close. Why is this one older? And I'm going to show you the examples of the World War II style ones. These are German, by the way. If you ever see these, these are German. This is the Memento Mori. Uh, and he ha we have the skull and the crossbones of Adam. Uh, it means mortality or something like that. And then we're going to move up and then we're going to see Jesus right here on the crucifix with this uh, very old, look at that, that little halo above his head with the sacred heart. That's the sacred heart with the crown of thorns. And then right there, the normal thing you usually see on a crucifix, I-N-R-I. -I. And then we're going to look close. And why was this handmade? Okay, most of these were machine made in right around the 20s, 30s, into World War II, up until even today they make these. All right, but why is this handmade? Let's look at it closely. And what do you notice? I don't know if you can see this. Hold on. Let's let's try to get a focus on this if my camera will indulge us. But, yeah, my camera is not going to indulge us in that uh, luxury. There we go. Uh, you're going to see file marks. So you're going to see, like, actual lines. This is like... Um, forensics like a lot of times you'll watch those forensic shows about murders and they'll be like there was file marks on the bone and they sawed the bone into pieces and you'll see little lines um yeah to get rid of bodies like people do that sometimes they sore yeah let's not talk about that i'm into true crime i like to watch a lot of that stuff but you can see you see the lines and then it goes into the metal the brass well that's how you could tell it was handmade now a lot of these were made between the late 1700s to the mid 1850s and this is that old yes okay here's on the back and we're going to look again at the file marks if we you see the file marks that's not paint that is uh file marks you see that and that's how you know your crucifix is old now i'm going to try to clean it you know i mean give it some of its luster back this is ebony wood ebony wood is one of the most expensive woods in the world so um it's almost endangered. Well, around this time that this was made, it was almost endangered because of the fact everybody liked to use it in any, um, you know, any kind of uh, boxes and furniture and, well, for the rich <laughs> or for, for crucifixes. All right, so I'm going to show you the 1940s ones really fast, the World War II ones especially. Hold on, let's go ahead and uh, segue over. All right, so we're going to look at some World War II chaplain crosses or on the battlefield uh, crosses. Mostly Wehrmacht officers used to have these. And here we have one that's in stock. Let's check it out. World War II, baby. And uh, let's try to blow this up. But you see, it looks a lot like our crucifix. And it turns out, now that I'm looking at this, this is not World War II. This is actually a really old one much like mine so this one's not world war ii the, the seller thinks it's world war ii okay and i can tell you how you see the edges of the metal you see how it almost um is non-existent on the edges um the earlier ones had uh more ebony wood going across it and up and down than the later ones all right i'm going to show you let's try to find one that yeah this one this one is very old you see the file marks this person thinks it's World War II. You see, it's so easy to get these confused. All right, let's try to find one. Here we go. This is a perfect example of a World War II um, 
Oh, of course the page isn't working. Why, why, why should anything work for me? All right, let's try to find one. We'll go into images and we'll try to find one. Here we go. Here is a World War II, either nuns or priests pectoral. And if you look at the edges, I'll try to show you the edges of this. You see how there's more brass and the little inset with the with the uh, wood is much smaller. Okay, that's telling me that's World War II. That's right around, uh, yeah, right around World War II or it could be World War I. Very hard to tell with these. And as you can see, a lot of people uh, incorrectly uh, attribute these. Here's another one, $89. They call them the skull and crossbones. And here we go. This one definitely is World War II. Even on the back, we had the Sacred Heart right there in the center with the crown of thorns. You can see that the metal is actually the lip of the metal is much more than mine. And the ebony placard that goes in there is much smaller. But if you notice, let's uh, try to go back here. If you notice, these look a heck of a lot uh, similar. You can't really tell them. And so, yeah, uh, that's how you know. But the file marks are a dead giveaway. And if it's marked Germany, most likely it is later. It is not an earlier one. Uh, they had laws that you had to start marking stuff at the country of origin, especially starting in 1890. In the USA, things had to be marked. So if this was to be made and sold in the USA, it would uh, have to have the uh, country of origin on it. So you know the earlier ones do not have that marking. And uh, these sometimes can sell for a lot of money. And uh, let's look at some more. Here we go, $1,040. Uh, so some of these are overpriced, but um, 1,040 Germany. Now this is a Golgotha, by the way, Golgotha. It's a place I believe where Jesus, I think died. I'm not sure, but that's the skull and the crossbones design. And uh, these are very, very sought after. Um, but I don't know if it's really worth, what's the price? 1,040, but um, yeah, um, these can be very pricey to collect. Here's another example. $250 World War II. Let's check out this person. So yes, it is World War II. How can we tell? Because again, do you see the, the metal going across and up and down? The ebony wood is less, it takes up less in real estate. And this one being sold for $250. There we go. So now you got your little lesson. I'm going to show you one more website. I was going to actually pull it up on my phone because it's easier to see, you know, but I'm, I'm filming my screen. And here's a, like a little European uh, cross museum online. And here we go. And they're talking about these crosses and collecting them. And so here we go. Uh, let's go ahead and show you the profession crucifixes. They're crucifixes because they were traditionally worn around the waist by religious priests, brothers, and sisters, and often attached to full rosaries. They were profession crucifixes and given to one when he took his or her vow of profession. And here we go. Aluminum crosses with inserts. Now, aluminum wasn't actually uh, affordable until about uh, 1889. So anything, if you see, you're, you're gonna see the earlier ones with uh, brass. Uh, because aluminum was way too expensive. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, it was $1,200 per kilogram in 1852. It was more uh, valuable than gold. Okay, so it was a, a very expensive thing. So if you see the chrome or the silvery colored ones, they're actually later. Okay, so here's one from the 1700s. And uh, here's uh, three variations of the crosses that are early. And again, if you look, you got the file marks. Okay, so we got uh, small, medium, and large. Some of them are butted out. Uh, hard to tell between the butted out ones if they're the earlier ones, but look for those tool marks. And here we go, three crucifixes with variations and ger uh, German. And they date back uh, to the late 1700s to the early 1800s, these ones. And just like mine, do you see the little tool marks going throughout it, yes. And uh, not all of them had the sacred heart on the back of them. Some of them go missing also, but here we go. And German crucifix, here's a second example. This one is the mid 1800s. And uh, you don't see as many tool marks as the earlier one. You don't see as many uh, file marks. All were made by hand, these ones. And uh, from the 1800s to the early 1900s, but the older ones, early 1700s to late 1800s, seldom have a manufacturing mark. 
sometimes a blacksmith mark. They can be inlaid with almost anything. And uh, here we go. The halo, many different designs. And you can see that. The file markings. Okay, so it says file markings on the right. And look at our three examples here. You do see file markings, but the earlier ones had the most file markings. And you can see it even goes down into the ebony, which is quite cool. Here is what I think. Why are a lot of these World War II German crucifixes in the USA? Okay, it was not a known thing. Well, the Nazis did not like the Catholics. And, uh, yeah, because the Catholics did not want them to, you know, go to war and to harm people by putting them in concentration camps. And so the Nazis were not happy with the Catholics, but there was a large population of German, of German, uh, Catholics. As a matter of fact, uh, Pope Pius, I believe Pope Pius the, uh, the 12th gave them, uh, a, a rule that you cannot be a Nazi and be a Catholic. And so they snuck these. And, uh, well, mostly the Wehrmacht. German soldiers would have had a crucifix if they were Catholic. But if you were a Nazi, you would not. Now, why do I think a lot of the World War II ones are in the USA? Because a lot of American soldiers, they went uh, treasure hunting. So if you got a kill, you would bring back, uh, I don't know, a German's a Ruger uh, that you killed, like a gun. Or a German's dog tags. or You know what I mean? So if you got a kill, you would rip something off, like sort of like grave rob, and take pieces back of you know your adventures in a uh, war and uh so i think a lot of uh, american uh gis or soldiers brought back these pieces off of the people that they yeah that they sort of slaughtered in war nothing wrong with that it's the spoils of war but this one is very old so we're going to try to we're going to try to clean this up and i'm going to get some simicrone and try to get this blackened uh schmutz off of it and uh try to like condition this wood because this is um, actually museum. This is something that belongs in a museum. It is that old. It is just really that amazing. And we're going to try to clean it up. So go ahead and uh, stay tuned while I come back and we'll see if we make any headway with cleaning this. Because this is, yeah, this is really atro atrociously uh, dirty. And this was a great deal at 20 bucks. I have my cleaning supplies out, which consists of Simicron and, uh, <laughs> yes, it's, it's really used. A uh, polishing rag for metal with a buffing side. I'll give you links to buy this stuff. But we're going to start out on an inconspicuous area. By the way, look how filthy this is. This is just really, really dirty. And we're going to start like on the back, on a spot you wouldn't see. I doubt if this is bronze, it's going to be very hard to clean this up. Uh, bronze, you need acids to get these stains off. And regular brass cleans up nicer. So I hope it's not bronze. It's very hard to tell what it is. Snowing out. Oh, it's so pretty. Okay, so look how clean this got, all right? So this old cross has a new life. And I did the best I could to clean up all the rust and all the filth. And it's shining. Look at this. It's shining not as much as I'd like it, but it's shining really nicely. And my guess is this was made between the 1820s and the 1850s. Really, really early old cross. I couldn't get in every nook and cranny. I just noticed a spot on his neck and his hand, but I can get that black stuff right off with Simicrone and it's looking real good. And what is something like this worth? It's actually worth what someone's willing to pay for it. So if I put it in my Etsy shop and I listed it for a thousand dollars, somebody will come along. I'm not kidding you. It's happened to me when I used to sell, I used to put prices on things that were really ridiculous and people, it might take a year. It might take six months. It may take two years and I'd get a sale. So I would list this for between $995 and $1,075. Is it worth that much? Hell no. But uh, <laughs> if you wanted to sell it on Fleabay, $19.99. So <laughs> once again, thanks for watching. Now you learned a little cross history. You do know that those lines indicate that it was hand filed. You can even see the file marks travel along into the ebony wood. In the same direction, we know that this is an early handmade crucifix that was probably used by a clergy person, um, a nun or a priest or um, a battlefield uh, soldier. Well, there was no battles in the 18, oh, the Civil War. <laughs> um, but I'm guessing that this was made between 1820 and 1850, right around there. Could be Civil War. And uh, this uh, could have went on the battlefield with a soldier. And uh, yeah, because they didn't start like like machine making these until like after the 1860s and mass producing them. But this was all done by hand. Each file, look at that. Do you know how many 
thousands of uh, files back and forth, back and forth with the with the file utility. Uh, uh, what do you call that? A file, <laughs> a metal file. I took shop class in school, and I remember the metal file. Imagine just sitting there stroking this thing with, come on, focus, focus, damn it, uh, with thousands back of back and forth motions, just to make this darn thing. Yeah. And then they uh, started mass producing everything, and there you go. So thanks for watching. See you guys all soon, and so long.